Presented by Caltech. And today I'm going to do my like shift gears in the course. And you will hardly see me write down that forced damned, damned equation again. Pretty literally. It's not going to come up for most of the rest of the course. It's going to be a whole different look at the concept of oscillation from things. So in a certain sense, we like covered the part of the vibrations, the oscillations. Now it's the waves part of things. And what we realize is that even if you forget what the underlying oscillation structure looks like, what every single oscillator is doing, you can still work out, still understand what's happening at a more emergent macroscopic scale. Okay? So if you've not really understood what the damping term does or what the driving term does, the math bothers you, that's fine. It's a new day, it's a, it's not, it's a new day, but it's not a new week, but it'll be a new whole uh, array of things. Okay? And hopefully we all know what's going on. I'll try to connect back to the basics again, but um, what like follows from today, all the math, all the machinery, it's going to be pretty new. And from here, we like venture into like magnetic waves, we talk about interference, diffraction, a whole bunch of like uh, more novel concepts, okay? So, uh, all right, so no office hours, anything else? That's pretty much it, okay. So waves, let's make some waves. So waves, I'll give you like a broad picture first, and then we talk about examples. And of course, I just had like one hour to cover the whole week's material, so I'll be able to I'll jump a few things around to kind of give you the whole picture and you'll see how it goes. So waves basically are again a consequence of coupled oscillations in its microscopic structure. You have a bunch of masses connected by springs or you have a bunch of pendulas or atomic uh, like atoms connected by interatomic interactions and so on and so forth. And this coupled chain of, oscill uh, of oscillators, if I try and disturb one end of it, a wave is a very particular solution for which that disturbance at one end like propagates all throughout. Okay, this is hard. I tried this out last night. I already couldn't get it done. So, like, I'm a bad answer. <laughs> so it's about these very particular solutions which are a disturbance at one end and propagate through the coupled oscillators. And why would they propagate? Because they are coupled. If I disturb something here, this particle talks to the next, next talks to the next, and so on and so forth, and the disturbance propagates. A normal mode, on the other hand, was a collective feature of the end particles. This is more like a localized or delocalized excitation <coughs> vibration, which is propagating in space and time. Okay? So it's a consequence of coupled, coupled oscillators, and these are particular solutions. And by the word particular, I don't mean the word particular in the in the if q language. It's like a very particular solution. Particular solution to coupled oscillators. Such that what I want is that I'm going to be looking at a wave propagator. And for now, I'll be focusing on transverse waves. Okay. So, and the word transverse means perpendicular. So the the, uh, the vibration or the oscillation is perpendicular to the direction of motion. Okay. So if my wave is propagating along the x direction, that's where the wave is propagating, there are a bunch of oscillators lined along the x. I perturb them, and then there's a wave which propagates. Let's say the wave looks like that. Okay. Some arbitrary shape. And this is the coordinate of oscillation y. Okay. <coughs> so y is what is really oscillating. Like in your, in your last homework, those bunch of springs in the transverse direction, that's the y coordinate. Okay. If you have atoms vibrating up and down, that's the y coordinate. And what we're looking for, we're looking for solutions, y which depend on both x and y. So far, you've discussed trajectories. This is, this is subtle and crucial. So far, you've discussed trajectories of individual particles, which are coupled, their time dependence. Now we're looking at a collective excitation and how that excitation as a whole is propagating through these coupled oscillators. Okay? So we're looking at the y as a function of x and t. There are a bunch of particles dotted along here which are oscillating. <coughs> and let's say this particular picture is a snapshot at some time. Okay? 
So this is at time t, let's say. So at t equals zero, for example. So I take a picture. That's how the oscillation, uh, the the shape looks like of these coupled oscillators at this time. Okay. And these waves, of course, you know, just like say another generic line about this. They would have consequences for ENM waves, for gravitational waves, water waves, you name it. And we can discuss as we go along, of course. Okay? And you might ask, what is Y? So again, like in the homework problem, why was the why was the transverse coordinate of the end particles? It could be something in the medium of particles oscillation. It could be the electric field. It could be the magnetic field. Okay? This Y is a generic coordinate. It could represent anything. Okay, so this could be the actual physical motion of a particle, or motion of this of this of this uh, of this waveform. It could be electric fields, it could be magnetic fields, and so on and so forth. And of course, starting next week, we'll talk about particular <coughs> EMP solutions, which will make the magnetic waves. So oh, that's that. And it's transverse. Uh, the other counterpart is longitudinal waves, for which the the oscillation is along the line of propagation. So if my oscillation was in the x direction itself, that would be a transverse wave. And sound waves are transverse waves. Uh, light waves are uh, sorry. Sound waves are longitudinal waves. Light waves are, are transverse waves. So are uh, gravitational waves. String waves are transverse waves. But sound is longitudinal. It propagates parallel to the, to the direction of propagation. Okay, so what do I want? I want that, if this is the snapshot at time t, this, this waveform has the same shape, but it travels through those end particles coupled. <coughs> okay, so what I want is, I want it to shift to here at some time t. Okay, it should propagate. And if it's moving, it must have some speed, and the speed is v, for example. I'm calling the speed V, not the velocity. So it's a positive number. Okay. The speed V is a, is a positive number by the convention. Okay. So what kind of functions? I'm sure like you've seen this before in lecture, hopefully. I can look a little bit quick now. But what kind of functions obey this kind of a feature that when shifted in time, they just move with the same shape ahead? This is a plot on the X. These are two time snapshots. How do you shift a function? Just remember, you know, your basic functions. Say if I have a, say I have a parabolic function, right? This is, let's say, f of x. What's f of x minus a for positive a? How, where does that go? Does it go up or down or left or right? Yeah. Left or right. Uh, left or right. Right. right? right, okay? So when I have a minus sign with a positive number, the function shifts to the right, right? So if I can just subtract out a certain constant number, which represents the shift in that variable itself, I shift to the function. Okay. Now for this, how much time did I wait? T. How much did I move by? X, that's fine. So how much did I move completely? For time t at speed v, how much did I cover? V times t. Okay. So functions of the form x minus vt are the ones which remain preserved in shape as time goes on. If you take a snapshot now, wait some bits some time, take another snapshot, that function has moved. Okay. I could also have a solution which has a positive sign in between. I'll say what the positive sign really means. But the point being that both of these kind of shifts, in the left or the right, depending on how you're shifting it, these generically make transverse wave solutions. So this particular form, like x minus vt, is going to be crucial to how we how we look at things. Okay. Now here's the deal. Um, if the sign of the function between the x and the t terms, now this is this is how you would think about it. Uh, people often get confused about how do I figure these things out. There's again a way of thinking about it. Look at the x term and the v term uh, and the t term. If the relative sign is negative, so if the relative sign between x and t, x and t terms is positive, which way is the wave moving? To the left, okay? 
If it's a positive sign, the function gets shifted to the left. So this is a left mover. And if the relative sign is a negative, it's a right mover. Do we all see that? This is shifting of functions? If any questions, please ask because this will be crucial in understanding everything that happens ahead. And then often people would you know, ask me, I don't know where to start. I don't know what the starting point should be. These are the starting points. There's like little concepts about figuring out what the physical setup looks like. And then it's a matter of just you know, doing some math. Is it okay, everyone? You all see it? All right. And what's the speed of the particle? Just by looking at it. It's the coefficient of the t term divided by coefficient of the x term. Okay? And this is a generic rule. So let me put this down somewhere important. It'll be here. At the speed of the wave, I'm gonna make a schematic right now to make a general picture come out of this. Speed of wave v is the coefficient of the x term divided by, sorry, coefficient of the t term divided by coefficient Extra. Okay. Of course, here it's just v over 1, so it makes sense, but we'll see this like, generalizes very soon. I figured a new way of using these words. I guess it's more efficient. Use the middle one first, check it out. Yeah, I was stupid. 27 years I wasted my life. Alright, so that's how basically how waves propagate. But you might ask if this is a wave solution, what is it a solution to? Okay? And I can be clip and say the wave equation. Okay? So here's how again it goes. N coupled oscillators, we worked out in the homework how they n particles, you have that tridiagonal matrix with, with twos and minus ones and stuff in the homework, remember? If I have n coupled oscillators, and I take the limit n to infinity, and the separation between these particles to zero, such that I retain n times delta x to be a finite constant number. Okay, so I increase the number of particles, reduce their spacing, so I keep the net length fixed, for example. This is called thermodynamic limit. And I'll just say why these things are important. So, of course, there is a microscopic structure, but I'm looking at the, at the thermodynamics in a certain sense, and we have the collective behavior of these n particles. If I write down those equations of motion, take these limits <coughs> and work it out as you did in the homework and hopefully in the lecture, it's just the equations of motion of those n particles. Newton's laws for each particle, but in this limit, what they look like is as follows. Partial square y, partial t square equals speed square, partial square y over partial x square. This is Newton's laws in a disguised form. N coupled oscillators, for each oscillator there's a, there's a spring tugging here, spring tugging there. Write the force equation, write that big matrix. Take the limit, which is done in the book, it was in the lecture, it's not that hard to figure it out. And what you find is that those equations of motion look like an equation which looks like the second derivative of y with time. And the partial, I hope we know what partials are. Partial derivatives are keep all the other variables as constants. Equals the speed squared, so not some v, this is the speed of the wave, times the second partial space derivative. Okay? So this is the wave equation. And I must mention that this, I'm going to be calling this the first two way wave equation. There are other equations for waves in this universe. Okay? This is not the only kind of wave equation. It's important. It represents transverse waves for string waves, for electric fields, magnetic fields, and so on and so forth. But it's one particular kind of a wave equation. Quantum mechanics has a whole different kind of wave equation. We'll probably talk about that at the end of the end of the hour today. So again, <coughs> in particles, that couplings, their equations of motion look like that. And I'm going to be condensing my notation. So dots are time derivatives. So y double dot is partial squared y partial t squared. Okay. The, the dot is a partial t derivative. 
And I'm going to be calling a prime as a, as a space derivative. So y double prime is partial squared y partial x squared. This is going to be my shorthand. So let me really help us out. Okay, so write down the write down the wave equation whenever you have a chance to do it. Look at the coefficients of the of the space derivative term when the coefficient of the t term is one. That coefficient is v squared in the wave equation. Okay, like for example, electromagnetic waves, electric fields, how they oscillate is they oscillate like this. E vector double dot is epsilon naught mu naught e vector double prime. Double dots are again partial square partial d squares equals some constant <coughs> times partial square e partial x squared and so on and so forth. And then we introduce things, a thing called the Laplacian. Do you know what the Laplacian is? So this was in one dimension. This was the second derivative in one dimension. Had I had, let's say, three dimensions, x, y, and z. Okay. So my <coughs> vector e depends on x, y, and z. The Laplacian is a generalization of the second space derivative. So the Laplacian, which is inverted triangle squared, that's the notation, acting on E vector, it's just um, partial square EX over um, del X squared as partial square UY, del Y squared plus partial square EZ, del Z squared. So E has, of course, three components, EX, X hat plus EY, y hat plus e z z hat and the Laplacian is just take the individual components, second differentiate with their respective coordinates, add them up together. That's it. So the Laplacian in one dimension is just the double plan that we had before. Okay. So if this is my wave, let me write it down as a, as a good notation now. This is del squared. So this is the Laplacian squared. It doesn't need to be <coughs> all right. So, by just by looking at it, what's my speed of the wave? What's v? Did I get everything right? I think it, this, this is an inverse. This is a one over epsilon. So what's my speed of the wave? Look at the coefficient, its square root is the speed, okay? So the speed is just one over square root, you know, epsilon naught, which for the case of electromagnetic waves, epsilon naught is the, is the electric per permeability or permittivity of free space. Mu naught is the magnetic permeability of free space. We put them together, this comes out to be the speed of light. And of course I did. I would like to, you know, give you that ah moment that was done in phase one, so I can do it. So just electric magnetic fields propagating at the speed of light c, which is around three to the eight meters per second in vacuum. This was the wave equation for electric fields in vacuum. Okay, which is an example of our physics two a wave equation. Okay, and. Those y of y x comma t of those forms are solutions to this wave equation. Okay. So, how do we work things out? Any questions? <coughs> All with me? Okay. We're gonna like pick up now. It's pretty fast. All right. So, particular solutions, like one kind of solutions, are plane wave solutions. And those are the ones for which the amplitude doesn't depend on distance. That's one feature. And they oscillate sinusoidally. So therefore, the phase is the same <coughs> at each plane. Okay? So plane wave solutions, so like y, x comma t, something like a cosine of something, okay? Or a sine, or an exponential, things like that, okay? Therefore, the student is like things like that. They could be sums with amplitudes, but the, the dependence on x and t will be oscillatory dependent. Okay? <coughs> the i something. Okay? We usually parameterize this something dependence as a kx 
plus or minus omega t. So kx plus or minus omega t. If it's a plus, where is the wave moving? To the left. If it's a minus, to the right. It has the form x minus something times t. I'm just rescaling everything else. I could pull the k out, it becomes x plus minus omega over k times t. So it has that form of the wave equation for the wave solution. Okay. So at this stage, omega and k are independent. There is no connection between omega and k. Okay. You want to find that connection between omega and k for which this thing solves the wave equation. Okay. People often get confused. I was working with with sine omega naught t's and things like that. Suddenly I have k's and omegas floating in. What's the connection? K and omega are undependent right now. Under the wave equation, they get connected. Okay. So for this to be a solution of my equation, omega must be a function of k. So that's a solution. And this is called the dispersion equation. So how do we find it? Plug it back into the wave equation. Okay. The left hand side is a second time derivative. Let's use the exponential because again, the same thing as the real part is, is a, the cosine. So what's the, the second time derivative of e to the i k x, let's say minus omega t. So let's, let's look at y x comma t, my wave is like e to the i k x minus omega t. It's a, it's a light mover. What's y double dot? What is the what does the dot do here? Pulls down what? Minus. minus i omega. Okay? Twice. Double derivative. So it's minus i omega squared and expansion of the stubborn functions, they stay the way they are. Okay? What's y double prime? A prime is a space derivative, it's an x derivative. When I do an x derivative here, what do I put down? I k. Twice because of the, of the double space derivative. So it's I k squared and y again because y, because y is, is the stubborn function, it's like an exponential. Again, this was my guess. This was my answer. Okay. And for this to be a solution, y double dot equals v squared y double prime, let's plug it back in. i squared is minus one, so I have minus omega squared y equals v squared. i squared is minus one, so this is minus k squared y. <coughs> so for this to be a solution, of course the y has to be non-zero, it cancels off. So omega is just, um, rather, yeah, omega is just v times k or v equals omega over k. Now here's the big revelation. The speed of the wave, as I said before, is the coefficient of the time term divided by coefficient of the x term. Speed is coefficient of the time term divided by one of the x terms. That's how you always find it. If it's e to the i 10x minus 27t, it's 27 over 10, okay, whatever the numbers are. So again, this is the coefficient of t over the coefficient of x. And the wave speed is a, is a property of the material, of the kind of the wave. So if you have a string wave, it will depend on tensions and, and, and mass per length and so on and so forth. If you have electromagnetic waves, it depends on properties of free space. Right? So the, the V is a fixed thing depending on the medium. And how omega and k are connected, that's the dispersion relation which makes my sinusoidal ansatz an actual solution of the wave equation. Okay? So this is a linear wave equation. It's linear <laughs> only because I had the first two wave equation. For other equations, it would not be of the form omega equals VK. Okay? Uh, over here, because I have an i square. Yeah, but if you just take like the coefficient of t over the coefficient of x, it's negative. 
Uh, okay, so maybe I should say this way. So the speed is a positive number, it's the speed. So look at the, the absolute values of the coefficients and let the relative sign tell you the direction. So keep it separate, it will really help you out in figuring out what's happening. Okay, um, little tips and tricks. Omega does not depend on the medium. Let this settle in your minds. This is going to come up over and over again. Omega is a source dependent feature. It is what is creating the wave, okay? So omega is source dependent. It's medium independent. Whereas k and speed v, they are both medium dependent, okay? So this is medium dependent. These little like excerpts of things will come in very handy over the next four weeks. So I think these are important because if you just like skip and go to the like bigger examples, you're missing out on a lot of stuff. So what's happening is that omega is medium independent. The product of V and K conspires, even though V and K are individually medium dependent, but they cancel them out in such a way so that omega is, is, is medium dependent. <coughs> And then some more notation, we call k as the wave number, and it's defined as 2 pi over the wavelength of the, of the wave. And so, so k is the wave number. Wave number. And um, of course, yeah, the rest is like follows. You can connect this. That's how you connect omega with speed and the wave number. If you just plug everything back in, omega is 2 pi times the usual frequency f, I should call it nu, because I have already have an f there. So 2 pi nu, nu is the frequency in hertz. V, k is 2 pi over lambda, the wavelength. So what you get from here, you get v is equal to nu lambda, which is what you learned in high school, what you learned in physics one. That's how these wave relationships come through. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a manifestation of this kind of a solution x minus vt, kx minus omega t, t minus x over v, had the same form, okay? And I should mention that these are plane wave solutions because the amplitude, whatever I had here, whatever a would enter, let me call this equals to a or something, this a is a constant, it doesn't depend on x. So this doesn't depend on, on x. You might say amplitude is always constant. No. This is a wave which is propagating through the sinusoidal wave, has a constant amplitude. You can have a spherical wave. Me speaking, if I was a point source, I'm not a point source. If I were a point source speaking out, my waves would be spheres. And then amplitude actually fall down as they went ahead. So therefore, when I speak, people at the back hear me less loudly than people at the front because the amplitude is actually dropping out as the space increases between me and the, and the observer. So for other kinds of waves, like spherical waves, this might be on the home course, I'm not solving this. Spherical waves, the amplitudes depend on the radial drop of distance, okay? All right, if we rush, there's too much to be done, but let's see how much we can cover today. A particular example of my first wave, wave equation is a, is, a, is a wave on a string. String wave. Again, you have a bunch of particles, a string, you send something. The wave equation is partial square y partial t squared equals t squared partial square y partial x squared. And for the string, the speed is just the tension in the string the forces which keep the string dot divided by the mass per unit length. Okay. So mu is the mass per length for the string, t is the tension. Okay, that's the that's the physics two wave equation for a string. Okay. Alright. Time for example. So say I go out to Millikan. Okay. Tall building. How, how tall is Millikan? Do anyone have any thoughts about that? How much do you guess in the future? In that? Like a library. Yeah? 
as, as good engineers and good scientists, it's, it's important to also be able to estimate things because often estimates are important. I was once in this um, in this science quiz competition. It was back in high school, I guess, in class. Uh, this is my junior year, I think. It was supposed to be national television, like the final round of a quiz competition, the buzzers and stuff. And we had an estimation round. So they gave us a, a stack of newspaper and said, estimate how thick one sheet is. Or just give me a newspaper. So come up with ways to, you know, kind of come up with estimates. That's really important as a as scientist, I think. So again, I'm a bad scientist. I have done this online. Millikan is 44 meters in length. Okay. So that's Millikan. That's where you drop your pumpkins from. Wait. Does this still happen? The pumpkin drop there? Yeah. Okay. I never seen this part. I like went for my first year and then I got bored. Anyways, this is sorry, I didn't mean to offend. This is 44 meters in length. Okay. And I have, someone is dangling a rope from Millikan. And it's a rope, it's a string. And you're at the bottom, and you want to signal someone at the top. So you send in a pulse. So you make a pulse, you jerk it, and this pulse travels upwards. Okay. My question to you is, how much time does it take for the pulse to start at the bottom, and it stop? Let's do a small pulse, like a peak pulse. It goes all the way up. So after how much time, would you observe the pulse at the top? How do you go it? That's all you're given. Thoughts? We need to find the velocity, like the tension in mass. Excellent. So we need to find the, the velocity. If you know the velocity, if you know the distance, I can find the time. So the question, how do I find the velocity? You're like, aha, you have a formula there. I can plug in chalk. Do you know T? Do you know mu? It's just some rope that I got in the market. You can just purchase it. First of all, is along this rope that that's dangling out, this is the rope, okay? Is the tension a constant across the rope or not? If I had a simple horizontal rope, tension is same everywhere. But now for a dangling rope, is the tension the same or not? as you go along the rope. What forces are acting on the rope? Gravity and tension. Okay. So if I look at, let's say, a certain amount of rope mass here, how much mass is pulling down on this particular chunk? This entire length of the rope is pulling it down. Okay. So let's call this height as h. Okay. So how much gravitational force is acting on this Little chunk of the rope due to everything hanging below it. H is the height. Mu gh. The moment I have a height, I can think about it in terms of mass for length. So mu g, mu h is the mass of this section of the rope times g. That's my gravitational force. Now this section of the rope is not moving; it's just hanging there, like just chilling out. So this gravitational pull is balanced by the tension on the rope. <laughs> okay. So the tension at any point depends on how high you are at. If you're at the top, the entire mass is pulling you down, hence there is maximum tension to keep it up. At the lowermost point, there's nothing pulling you down, there is no tension. So here tension depends on the on the location on the wave. Here tension is a constant. Honestly, um, this is an approximation what I'm doing here. I want to do a more rigorous analysis because in this wave equation, t is supposed to be a constant. It's not supposed to depend on x. Then it depends on the height on the on the coordinate itself. Okay. But if you can neglect those approximations for like for like small waves, for uh, for like yeah, it's a simple approximation. I don't want to get that there. If I have t, what's my speed? Square root t over mu. T is mu hg over mu, the mu goes away, like, aha, uh -huh. didn't need the t, didn't need the mu. g is just square root hg. As h changes, the speed changes. How much is the time taken to go from h0 to h44 meters? For a little distance dh, that's my speed, at h. Okay, what's the time? 
the time is distance upon uh, speed. Yeah. Yeah. So for a for a little for a little distance dh along the row, I have a speed v at that h, and I integrate over all h from h equals zero to some parameters. And if we solve for this, this is around 4.2 seconds. So in 4.4 seconds, we can send the pulse up medical for the standard flow. Doesn't matter what the flow is. Isn't the parentheses actually mm -hmm. the variable? Uh, v has a function of h, because v depends on where I am. So therefore, the integral, it's not just a division, because it depends on where you are. So you're adding up the two terms. OK, uh, any questions? With me, let's take a minute. I went, you know, decently fast today. Maybe part of this was stuff you've seen before. I hope this like, gives you a new light to look at things as a bigger, bigger picture. So, any questions? Oh, take your time. Yes. Um, on the board up there, mm -hmm. you box and some weird letter in Zandra. Yeah. What's the weird letter? It's called new. What is the purpose? Uh, great. So, thank you. That's important. We need to know our letters. So, new. It's called new. In LaTeX, you put a backslash and new. You get that. Very cool. So, new is the, is the frequency in Hertz. What you would call F typically. I would send her for I was using F somewhere else and I would like to confuse people. So that's that's more like a standard uh, physicist's notation for, for frequency. You don't use F. I don't use F. We use this. Any other questions? I feel really tight on time today because I just have one hour to do like a whole week of thing. Can we go 10 minutes over time? Um, yes or no? I can, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just like look here, just to say yes or no, like everyone together or something. Yes or no? No. no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know who you are, do I? <laughs> All right, so this is gonna be hard now. Okay. Um, where is that boundary? Okay. I'm not going to prove stuff because I have less time. I think the proof was important because it does shed light how to like approach these problems, I feel like, in the more generic picture. But I think this should, this should serve enough, I guess. So, in lecture, I think uh, Frank was discussing um, the reflection and transmission of uh, current and voltage pulses in, a, in an LC circuit. So read that in his notes. I'm not going to repeat it because it's just a simple derivation of things. The notes have it very nicely. I'll give a more generic picture of how to pose these problems in an, in an overall world view. So think about, let's say, a string on the left side, and there's a junction, let's say, at x equals 0. And there's another string on the right hand side, a different string. The string on the left has some tension T1, mass per length mu1. This one has T2 and mass per length mu2. Okay. And I'm looking for waves propagating. And I want to understand what happens when a wave propagates to the left hits the junction. We have tied up the two strings together. And again, this thing is generic. I'm using the word strings, but it applies to any waves, any transverse waves of my physics to wave form. Okay. So, um, y x comma t is some y on the left x comma t for for x less than zero, and some y right on x comma t for x more than zero. Okay. Why do you do this? Because I know it's going to be some different kind of equations because string one, 
string two, you can have different kind of values. So I just separate my wave into two different pieces on the left and to the right. Okay. Now what I think about it is that I send in a wave from the left hand side along the string, such that it approximately hits the, the junction at t equals to zero. Okay. I start my stopwatch at the instant this wave roughly hits the it's the junction. Something weird happens. So this is at t equals to zero. When it hits the junction, what do you expect? Physically, this wave comes in, hits the junction. Now what happens? Before hitting, it's just like one wave propagating from the left. This way. Once it hits the junction, what happens? Something goes through, and something might get reflected back. The junction might send something back. Okay. So for t, sorry, for t more than zero. As you know, it hit it, t more than zero, there is some other wave which propagates to the right, the transmitted wave, and there is some other reflected wave which is sent back in. Okay. And I could still have some incoming waves even after my first wave front hit the junction. So it's a sum of an incoming wave, which I'm going to call i, a reflected wave r, and a transmitted wave t. Okay. And this i is not the, the complex i. This is just the word incident, this i. Okay. So after time t equals zero, it's a sum of incoming wave, reflected wave, and transmitted wave. So y left is y incoming, x comma t plus y reflected, x comma t for t more than zero. That's what I'm most concerned about. And y right is some y transmitted, x comma t. You will also consider a left mover from the right hand side, like coming from infinity, you could, no harm, no foul, but let's keep it uh, practical for now. So, incoming wave, it's the junction, <coughs> there's still some incoming wave, there's a reflected wave, there's a transmitted wave. Right now, we don't know even the fact that would these shapes be the same or not? If I make some weird looking form here, does the reflected one look the same or not? I don't know that yet. How do you solve for this? You have the wave equation. What's the wave equation for the left hand side? Write it down. So the left side wave equation, partial square y, partial t square for the left side equals speed in that first medium squared. It's v1. E1 is how much? E1 over mu1 square root. Square is t1 over mu1. So this is t1 over mu1 times partial squared y left, partial x <coughs> This is my left side's equation. Right side equation is partial squared y, partial t squared on the right is t2 over mu2, partial squared y r, partial x squared. Okay. So individually on both sides, the wave is doing its thing. It's just propagating by these wave equations. The funkiness happens at the junction. Okay. So how do you approach the junction? What kind of connections connect the two waves at the junction? Incoming wave, reflection, transmission, left side, right side. What happens at the junction? The junction is another point. If the left wave is different than the right wave, there'll be discontinuity. The string would snap. We don't want that to happen. We want it to be a continuous string. Okay? So at the junction, there's a continuity. Okay? So continuity is always one boundary condition that you would need to write down at the junction. So at x equals 0, which means y left at 0, comma t for all time is y right at 0, comma t. Okay? The left side part at the junction for all time is a continuous function. The string is not snapping. You see the snapping point, right? Pretty snapping. So this is y incident, which is 0 comma t, plus y reflected, 0 comma t, equals y transmitted. Okay. And whenever, this is like a math jargon, whenever I have a boundary condition on the function itself that I'm looking at, it's called a Dirichlet boundary condition. I don't know if you've heard this word before or not, but this kind of boundary which uses the functions itself is called a Dirichlet boundary condition after the 
of the mathematician vision x. The other equation is a force balance at the junction. The junction, there is some force on the junction, tugging it from the left, some force on the right. Okay? And you want the fact that if there were a net force at the junction point, what would happen? The junction point is an infinitesimal mass point. Remember that problem for you from your first homework? When you had these two springs in series? The middle point being massless, the net forces had to cancel out. Because a net, a zero mass point has a total zero force. Because if it did not, acceleration would be infinite. And it would just like go all the way which is not going to happen. So for a massless point, which is the junction, just a point, the net force is balanced. And you remember from your homework, the forces are like tension times sine theta in the transverse direction. For small angle, sine theta is theta, and theta is roughly tan theta. So therefore, the force balance tells you that the tension on the left side, E1, partial YL over partial X, which is sine theta, theta tan theta, that approximation, at x equals 0, equals t2 partial <coughs> y r partial x at x equals 0. This is my second equation, which matches things at the boundary. This involves derivatives of my, of my function, y. And whenever I have the derivatives in my, in my boundary conditions, they are called Neumann boundary conditions. Of the mathematician Neumann. So these two equations, <coughs> continuity and force balance, can be solved out. It, it takes some time, it takes some effort, but it can be solved. And what you find is a very beautiful relationship. So you can work this out. I'll send you notes over email for this thing. You can have a look in detail. Um, and Sorry, I'm sorry. When you solve for this, the reflected wave, yr, comes out to be, let me write this down, um, z1 minus z2 over z1 plus z2 times y incident, and y transmitted is 2z1, z1 over z1 over plus z2 times y incident, where z1 is, um, let me get the square roots right. Yeah, so z1 is t1 over speed 1, t1 over v1, and z2 is t2 over v2. t is, of course, square root, sorry, v is, of course, square root t over mu again. You can plug it in. And what you find is that this comes out to be square root t1 mu1, and this is square root t2 mu2. And these z's are called the impedances of that material. It depends on the tensions, the speeds, or the tensions, and the, and the mu's. Okay? So notice two important <coughs> things here. Y r, the reflected wave, is some number <coughs> times y i y transmitted is some number times y. The first important consequence is the fact that the reflected and the transmitted waves have the same shape as the infinite wave. Across a continuous boundary, the shapes don't change. So if I send in shape in the shape of me, in the shape of you, um, it stays the same after reflection and after that's one thing. And the way it's connected in amplitude depends on the impedances of the two materials. Okay? Crucially, what's important <laughs> is that if z2 is more than z1, if the impedance of the right string or the right material is higher, the reflection coefficient, this coefficient here, which is the so this is just um, reflection coefficient r times yi, 
it was just transmission coefficient t times yi. Okay. So the reflection coefficient <coughs> is it positive or negative? If it's equal to z1. Negative. That means yr and yi have a minus sign amongst them. So if I have a wave propagating in the positive side, the reflected one is an inverted wave. Okay? So the moment you hit a boundary of something more dense, of a higher tension or a higher mass density, the wave flips sign, the wave inverts. Okay? And if z1 is more than z2, then, um, then uh, it doesn't change sign. So you're going from a if you're going from a rarer to a denser medium, the wave flips. If you're from a denser to a rarer medium, the wave doesn't flip. Also, you should note, if z1 is more than z2, if, then the transmission coefficient is more than 1. So if you're going from a, if you're going from a denser to a rarer medium, the amplitude of the transmission wave increases. And this will be important. Okay? This is not violating energy conservation. We'll see, talk about this uh, in, a, in, a, in a few classes, but uh, so this is phase flipping is important, and this ampli amplification is uh, is important. Any questions about this? Of course, just scrambled through a lot. This whole thing takes an hour usually to like, solve and stuff, but uh, that's fine. So the point being, I think you'll look for this. Have a look. There's a way of solving. It's always about Writing down the continuity equation, writing down the force balance, usually about the derivatives, solving them together, and you get this. Yeah. How are we on time? We have about seven minutes. Okay. Let me talk about something, something cool. I think it'll be it'll be fun to see what goes on. Let's take a little detour for a second. Think about a small ball of mass m hitting a bigger ball of mass m. Okay. So small ball hitting a bowling ball, for example. We need, well, this, is, this is at rest to start, and this speed is v initially. Okay. You can go back one year. In physics 1a, we learned conservation of momentum, conservation of energy. And from there, you can solve for what happened at the collision and after the collision. So you can find that they, they collide. Uh, the small ball gets rebounded. The small ball after collision is going at some speed vr, the deflected speed. And the bigger ball is going ahead with some speed v transmitted of the ball. Just like regular mechanics. Okay? Do the energy momentum conservation, you get the answer. And what you find is that vr is m minus m over m plus m times the initial velocity v. Let me call this v sub i to make it more apparent. Incident speed. And v sub t is 2 little m over m plus m times v sub i. <coughs> this is what you, can, you have solved before last year. Hopefully, this looks a little familiar. But you can solve for this by energy momentum conversion. And notice that the steam forms of that. The m's are the impedances here. Okay, z1 minus z2, z1 plus z2, 2 z1 over z1 plus z2. So that's how these uh, these balls work. Now, now say that I um, now say little m is one kg and capital M is three kg. For example, I want to illustrate a point here. One kg and three kg, and I have some incoming speed vr. Okay. So for this case, what's vr? 1 minus 3 minus 2 over 4. So it's minus 1 half times v. So vr is uh, 1 half v as a magnitude. It's, it's going in the other direction and it's being rebounded. Okay. What's, uh, what's vt? 2m, so it's 2 times 1, 2, uh, divided by 4, so it's also half, half vr. Yeah. Okay? So the point being that the transmitted speed was half the incident speed. Okay? Who cares? We'll see why we care now. Forget the reflective one, we don't care about the reflective one so much. 
the transformation is going to be half part, half of the integral speed. Now, what if I introduce another ball in between? So be be between dividing a one kg and a three kg ball, I put in a two kg ball. Let the one hit the two, and the two hit the three. Okay, so I have a one kg, I have a two kg, and I have a three kg ball. Vi hits it. There's a there's a there's a there's a bound here. It's a there, there's a bound there. So you can use this twice, right? Find the transmitted speed of the second ball. Use it to find the transmitted speed of the third ball. Okay, it's just doing this twice, right? So when you find that the transmitted speed of this third ball, v t, is a, so this was 0.5 t. Okay, 0.5 vi. This is about 0.533 vi. You're like, I don't care. <laughs> but realize something. The speed went up. Then half. It's, it's slightly more. And what I did was I just decreased the, the differences of the masses. Okay? So if I keep adding balls of, of gradually increasing masses and then hit it, there is maximal speed being transferred than the incremental speed. So to kind of get it to have the most effect on the, on the final mass, have a continuous array of ever gradually increasing impedances. And that gives you maximum impedance matching. Okay, this is called impedance matching. Okay. So that's somewhat cool. Let's talk about a final thing using that kind of an understanding. Think about sound waves. So sound waves, for example, it is an interface of air and water. Okay? And I have a sound wave coming. The impedance of a sound wave, Z, if you remember from high school or your chemistry classes, hopefully, is given by the bulk modulus divided by the speed. It's the corresponding thing that you have there. You had a tension over speed. Tension in three dimensions is the bulk modulus. And the bulk modulus, again from chemistry classes or high school physics, hopefully you remember, is the density of the, of the material times V squared divided by V. This is just V. Okay. This is from, from other stuff. If you have not seen this, I hope you'll take my word for it. That's the impedance of a material in which sound is propagated, for example. So now if I look at the density of air, which is like 1 kg per meter cube, density for water, which is 1,000 kg per meter cube, the speed of sound in air, 340 meters per second, speed of sound in water, which you can measure, it's about 1430 meters per second, <coughs> plug everything in. An incoming wave from air hitting the water boundary, what's my reflection coefficient? It's Z air minus Z water over Z air plus Z water. Okay. You can plug real numbers in again, short on time. What you find this comes out to be, it's minus 0.994 something. This says two things. First of all, water is a denser medium, hence the incoming sound reflects with the phase flip. Secondly, R is almost one. So the reflecting is almost the incident with the face flip. So therefore, if I have a friend underwater and I shout at that friend, that friend will not hear me as well. Because most of it reflected back. Okay. One thing. Now this was when I had my medium to be infinitely big. Now for example, I am shouting in a pipe. I have nothing better to do than shout in pipes all day. There are two pipes, for example. Okay. I shout from here, there's another bigger pipe. Now, the actual area, the cross section area matters how much transference there's going to be. In this case, when I have finite cross sections, the impedance is not just, um, let me say this out correctly, it's not just rho times V, not the density times the, the speed, it also has a factor for the area. So, and it goes as one over area. 
If the area is higher, there is a lower impedance. You should imagine, right? A larger area will have less impedance of propagation. Okay, that's how it goes. So if I go from these two pipes connected, this is area A1, this is area A2. Okay. What's my reflection coefficient as I go from here to there? And of course, A2 is more than A1 in my construction. You can plug it in. You'll see it will be 1 over A1 minus 1 over A2 over 1 over A1 plus 1 over A2. So I've assumed that it's the same air here and there. So therefore, the same speed of the wave, same density of the material. Therefore, they don't contribute. But it's inverse of the area. So Z1 is 1 over A. Z2 is like 1 over A2, Z1 plus Z2. So this is A2 minus A1 over A1 plus A2. Okay. So what was mattering was the difference of A2 and A1. So if this difference, if this is large, if A2 is much bigger than A1, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So when this difference is large, there is a this difference comes in and gets divided up. For most impedance matching, you want the areas, just like a ball case, to be matched up. If it's, a dis, if it's a discontinuous jump in the area, there is less impedance matching. The transmission is, is small. But when you have a continuous area change from, from one to the next cross section, if there's impedance matching, there is maximum transfer of my incoming signal. right? So therefore, if I shout in this part, because of this bad impedance, that is like difference of the areas, there is not much propagation here. On the other hand, if I have a pipe which has a continuous area increase, just like the continuous balls with higher masses, this has good impedance matching because the areas are small. <laughs> if the difference in the areas are small, A2 minus A1 for a cross section is almost zero. So reflection is almost zero. Everything transfers out. And if A2 by 7 is large, there's some reflection. So when there's impedance matching, there is least reflection, most transmission, A2 by 7 is small, and hence a gradual increase of the area allows you to have maximal amplification of the sound. And therefore, when you think about megaphones, when you shout through a megaphone, it has this conical shape. That's why it has a conical shape. Because there's impedance matching in the sound as we go through. Okay? So let's call it day of the day and hopefully see you Wednesday with more oscillational waves. On Wednesday, we have chocolate in the class and a microwave. So I think you should.